Hello and welcome to our 10th lecture recap for SEMA P3 performance strategy. This lecture was on corporate governance. So the key concepts then firstly, corporate governance is a system of business governance. We can have two types of code, principle based like the UK combined code or prescriptive like the legislative approach of Sarbanes-Oxley in the US. The increased importance of corporate governance is really a response to corporate failures such as WorldCom, Enron, all those sorts of uh, failures that have occurred recently. And corporate governance generally covers three things, the board, the auditor and the shareholders' interests. So let's look at firstly at the UK Combined Code. Well it's called a Combined Code because it's a combination of various reports. Cadbury's report in 1992, which covered the split of the CEO and the chairman, separation of powers, communication of corporate governance, disclosure, and the comply or explain scenario. Greenbury then looked at director's pay. Hampel was in 1998. Turnbull in 98 looked at internal controls. Those three reports in 2003 covered the non-executive directors and the auditors. Together these all make up the combined code. In questions just refer to the combined code rather than specific reports. Principles of the combined code then. Firstly in relation to the directors and the board. Well there must be an effective board in place. There must be regular meetings and the responsibilities of the board must be set out. There must be a separate CEO and chairman to separate the power within the organisation. And there must be a split of executive and non-executive directors on the board. For a small company we need at least two non-executive directors. In a large company at least half of the board need to be non-executive directors. The board needs to produce timely information. It needs to have a formal transparent nomination process. It should have an induction process for new directors, performance evaluation for current directors, and they should be re-elected regularly so they don't just have a permanent seat on the board. Remuneration then. It should be enough to retain and attract directors, but it shouldn't be excessive. It should be performance related and set by an independent committee rather than set by the directors themselves. All of this should be disclosed. Things surrounding accountability and audit then. Firstly on the board. The board should identify the risks and have a balanced assessment each year. And it should appoint an audit committee. There should also be a strong relationship with the shareholders and the management to avoid the agency problem. Internal controls then. Management must first of all identify the risks of the business and design and operate internal controls to control those risks. So they should therefore undertake a risk based approach, have an annual assessment and have a board statement to this effect. So let's look in a little bit more detail at the audit committee. Why should we have an audit committee? Well it will make your external audit more independent because rather than reporting to the management board they can report to an independent committee i.e. the audit committee. They can appoint the external auditor or at least recommend this appointment for shareholders to undertake and they can manage the relationship with the external auditor. So how should we make up our audit committee? Well, They all have to be non-executive directors, no executive directors on the audit committee. At least one of them must have recent, relevant financial experience. They should have at least three meetings per annum and at least one meeting in the year with the auditors with no executive directors present. The sorts of things that the audit committee are responsible for then. Firstly reviewing the financial statements to ensure that they comply with whatever legislation or standards they are prepared under. They should review the internal control system. They should liaise with the external auditor. 
They'll review the internal audit reports that we've talked about previously. They'll discuss and set the audit fee. And they'll provide a whistleblowing function for the whole organisation and for internal audit. So how does the Audit Committee have a relationship with internal audit? Well firstly the Audit Committee will consider having an internal audit function at least once a year if they don't have one already. They'll appoint the head of internal audit. They'll review and assess the work of internal audit. And they'll assess the management response to internal audit reports, i.e. do management implement what internal audit tell them. How does the audit committee relate to external audit? Well, they'll recommend and appoint them as we've discussed. They'll oversee the selection process for new external auditors. They'll approve the scope of the external audit. And they'll undertake a post audit review implementing recommendations by external audit. So disclosures, corporate governance disclosures. First thing you'll have to disclose is the operation of your board. You'll disclose the names of any committee members on all the committees you have throughout the business. You'll disclose the number of members on each of those committees. You'll disclose the names of your non-executive directors. Your board performance will be assessed. You'll disclose the work of the nomination committee and the remuneration committee. You'll have a going concern disclosure stating that the business is a going concern. And you'll consider the need for an internal audit department if you don't already have one. So that was lecture 10 on corporate governance.